What do you get when you combine the calm delivery of a father figure, the formidable physique of an athlete, and you slap decades of degrees and research on it? You guessed it, Dr. Andrew Huberman. Stanford neuroscientist by day, podcaster by night, Dr. Huberman has taken the longevity and wellness communities by storm with his podcast, The Huberman Lab. He looks calm, collected, masculine with his black button down shirt, black background, and talks about hormones, neurotransmitters, and brainwaves in a way that is inspiring and educating to the public. In the science community, seeing a well-spoken scientist commanding the attention of the public is actually pretty thrilling. On the surface, he's the man. But is there something deeper there? When a respectable neuroscientist starts endorsing mountains of dietary supplements and protocols, has several sponsors per video, it's worth questioning a little bit. Let's get into Dr. Andrew Huberman, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there is a lot of info spanning many years of the podcast, so I won't be going over absolutely everything, but I want to touch on a few things. But first, my name is Dr. Christian Poulos. I'm a medical doctor who rejected that nine to five lifestyle to build my own businesses, and I'm here to get you jacked and healthy and more educated. So let me start by saying I'm no way against Dr. Huberman. I listen to a lot of his podcasts, apply many parts of what he says into my own life, but my goal is to teach you to take everything with a grain of salt. And frankly, he does that too. He claims, I'm a professor. I'm professing a number of things that you can decide for yourselves what to do or not to do. And I'm going to tell you how to better assess some of the data that he provides. So without further ado, let's get into the bad. In the science world, one thing that always makes me raise a red flag is when someone presents things with absolute certainty. It's a little sketchy. I'm sure you've seen it with a ton of people with way lesser credentials out there. And Dr. Huberman is smart and very forward thinking with a lot of his research and what he professes. But his podcast does delve a little bit into some bro science sometimes. Unfortunately, Dr. Huberman lacks a lot of skepticism with some of the things that he says. When he talks about neurological pathways or functions, it's based on peer reviewed science, which is awesome. But when he talks about supplements and some protocol recommendations, we do start getting into that mix of science and bro science. So first I want to talk about his interpretation of science. Let me give you an example. Imagine you saw a headline saying, researcher unlocks amazing secret to massive muscle growth. If you read the study behind the headline, you may find some real scientific research. It might be done in cells in a petri dish or mice. There may be some promising advancements in some biological pathway, which 20 or 30 steps down the line leads to more muscle growth. And in time, a study like this could pave the way for significant breakthroughs. But the ad researchers unlock amazing secrets to muscle growth isn't really that accurate because there's nothing actionable behind it. He's great at breaking these topics down and describing them in layman terms. But then he veers into recommendations. He is often taking one or two studies that aren't necessarily applicable to humans and then translates them into categorical advice. Like the do 10 minutes of red light therapy at 670 nanometers or ice bath for 11 minutes per week or X dose of X supplement at certain times. And sure, a lot of these things won't necessarily be harmful, but when he starts a podcast with raw science that's evidence-based and then gets into a seemingly bro sciencey type sales pitch about recommendations with the same soothing voice, tone, and attitude, things do get a little bit tricky. And I'm not saying Dr. Human's there to make money and sell you something, although I'm sure he's getting paid very well. And I agree that he's professing what he's found, but it's often in a way that doesn't allow the audience to know any better. And they will take the supplements and protocols at face value when they are presented. So before I actually go into the specific bad recommendations, I want to talk a little bit more about internal and external validity in science, as I feel like many Huberman's viewers do not have grasp on that. A lot of studies that Dr. Huberman mentions are very good studies, high in internal validity, which means that the studies are well designed and establish a connection between two variables. However, just because a study showed a particular effect with these two variables, it doesn't mean that scientists can apply that population-wide among very specific types of people, which is external validity. You are more complex than a mouse or some cells in a petri dish. And similarly, a study done in elderly untrained women probably won't apply to a 30-year-old guy who's been training on and off for the last decade. Unfortunately, Dr. Huberman is a little guilty of doing this sometimes. So let's dive in. So the products, let's talk about sponsors first. Right from the start, the Huberman Lab was sponsored by companies promoting products under the guise of science-based medicine. So first we have the classic Athletic Greens, AG1. Huberman says that if you're looking for an all-in-one daily supplement, AG1 it is. It comes with 75 ingredients total, including vitamins, minerals, spirulina, chlorella, fruit concentrates, antioxidants, herbal extracts, digestive enzymes, probiotics, and mushroom powders. A one-month supply starts at like 79 or $80, something like that. So we do fall into the multivitamin logic here. Might as well supplement with it because you don't know if you're deficient in these things, right? But truth is most people don't need a multivitamin or any of these things. There is insufficient evidence to recommend taking a multivitamin without any demonstrated deficiency. Supplementing with vitamins as a health insurance really is just making expensive urine as you're going to excrete a lot of the water soluble vitamins like vitamin C or the B vitamins. And it could be harmful with megadoses of the fat soluble vitamins like 
A, D, E, and K. So if you want an expensive tasting greens powder, go ahead and drink it if you like, but you're not really gonna be getting any benefit from these things because odds are you probably don't need a lot of the things that are in the supplement. Next sponsor is Inside Tracker, which provides blood and DNA tests to offer advice on weight loss, bone health, cognition, and more for prices ranging in the few hundreds of dollars. Sure, I can understand why people wanna do this and get more information about themselves, but I wanna highlight this one because it really goes against evidence-based practices. Physicians are actually encouraged to avoid doing tests that they don't think are indicated, especially patients with no symptoms. There are higher chances of false positives when you are doing routine testing that is not indicated and it could lead to more testing over time, more strain on the medical system, and it's just not needed. The Huberin Lab was also sponsored by an electrolyte drink company with a product that contains the electrolytes, sodium, magnesium, and potassium. Sure, these are things that will help an athlete replenish key electrolytes during a workout. But oddly enough, Dr. Huberman's pitch was that neurons required these electrolytes to fire action potentials, which is true, but we don't necessarily need an electrolyte drink to accomplish that. Dr. Huberman eventually had an episode on a rational approach to supplementation for health and fitness, and he talked about ashwagandha for support with stress, which I support, but then he gets into supplements with limited data on their usefulness. The first is Fadogia agrestis, which is a Nigerian shrub, and a plant called Tonkat Ali. These are said to increase testosterone, but the studies are very weak. This is the classic example of internal validity and external validity that I mentioned earlier. Just because a study was well done and shows boosts of testosterone in rats or elderly men that are untrained or cells in a petri dish, doesn't mean that it'll do that in a 25 year old or a 45 year old human reliably. Same with shilajit that is said to increase libido and well being. There just really isn't any quality human data that says that it does much of anything. And I know these things have all been trendy in recent years. So as for the protocols, let's get into some protocols that do not have much scientific backing. The first is one I love to joke about is shivering. Yeah, shivering. Dr. Huberman loves talking about brown fat thermogenesis. Basically, the body has two types of fat, white fat and brown fat. White fat is the typical fat you think of when you pinch your belly. It's just a fat that stores energy for longer term purposes. While brown fat is for creating heat and maintaining body temperature. In his Science of Fat Loss episode, one of the first episodes he ever did, he suggests you try the Soberg Principle. The protocol is to do a cold plunge or cold shower for about one to maybe even five minutes, get to a temperature that causes you to shiver, get out of the plunge, shiver for a minute or two, then get back in and repeat. So you're doing a few sets of cold plunge or cold shower, shivering your ass off, getting back in, shivering again for a span of about 10 minutes. The theory behind this is that succinate will be released from muscle and that will trigger brown fat thermogenesis or the burning of brown fat and also the conversion of white fat into brown fat because your body's like, shoot, we need more of this to maintain heat. He says that this will cause increases in metabolism and fat loss. But let me ask you this, how much fat do you think that 10 minutes of shivering will burn? Shivering burns roughly 400 calories per hour. So in 10 minutes, sure, you might burn 60 to 100 calories. I personally would rather go on a walk or a run to burn 100 calories. I think inducing shivering is going to be very, very miserable for 10 minutes. And as for brown fat, it's mostly present in babies anyway. It greatly decreases as you get older and become an adult. So I think the downsides of pure misery will definitely outweigh the fat loss benefits you're getting from a protocol like this. And beyond that, Dr. Huberman does greatly endorse ice baths, which I do have mixed feelings about. There are good parts to it. I think starting your day with something very hard, especially something as hard as an ice bath on a cold winter day, will be great for dopamine, mental resilience, fortitude. I support that, but I do think Dr. Huberman is greatly stretching the benefits of this. I do think ice baths will be the fad of this time when we look back you know, in 2035. He claims that 11 minutes of cold exposure per week is a reliable threshold to derive benefits in metabolism, insulin, and growth hormone. But the studies that Dr. Huberman cites in the podcast don't really support his claims. They are all stretches of the truth. The only real data of ice baths shows that one, it improves recovery for athletes, and two, interferes with muscle gain when done immediately post-training. Not really much evidence on metabolism, insulin, or growth hormone, unfortunately. And even if there are, the body tries to maintain homeostasis and will return to baseline pretty quickly. The next iffy protocol is one that was pretty trendy a few years ago. It is cooling intra-workout, particularly cooling of the palms. There was a systematic review and meta-analysis done a few years ago that looked at crossover studies that investigated the effects of intra-workout cooling on muscle gain and performance. They found that cooling improved strength and led to steroid-like gains. Like literally just cooling your palms in between sets increased bench rest strength by like 22% over the course of like 10 weeks. And so extraordinary claims do require extraordinary evidence. First, the authors of the study have a patent for the product that they are using in the study. Suspicious, but not enough to call BS. This product has also been around for 20 years to no real appreciable effects in their use in reality. And beyond that, there are some replications of the study that don't show the same benefits that Dr. Huberman links from his Stanford colleagues. I think this is another one where they focus too much on internal validity versus external validity and applying it to a population. 
The last protocol I want to discuss that is a bit flawed is the recommendation of protein consumption early in the morning. He argues that protein early in the day led to greater degrees of muscle maintenance and growth. He argues that the basic takeaway is that for the sake of muscle performance and growth, ingesting high quality proteins early in the day is key. This is because of variations in gene expression in muscle cells across the circadian rhythm. But Dr. Huberman fails to mention this study was done on untrained elderly women. Sure, protein consumption early in the morning could be a good thing to add to your morning routine. I'm not denying that. I'm not opposed to that at all, and I do recommend it to a lot of my own clients. However, I don't think lean body mass and grip strength in elderly untrained women will be representative of the entire population where you could draw this conclusion. So with that all being said, let's get into the good. So I understand that some of these studies on particular protocols or supplements may be beneficial to some people. And I do think that there are some protocols that Dr. Huberman recommends that are well rooted in science and can provide a lot of benefit to a lot of people. And so I want to highlight some of those. When he highlights the importance of the fundamentals of health, like diet, exercise, sleep, stress, he's usually pretty spot on. So the first protocol is non-sleep deep breaths or NSDR, which is kind of like a form of meditation. The basic idea is here that NSDR slows thought flow and brainwave frequency. And the goal is to enter a conscious sleep state and relax your brain, which is kind of like a meditation. Basically, you just take a 10 to 30 minute bout of relaxation where you control your breathing and consciously scan your body, relax each body part individually. Research shows that 20 or more minutes of NSDR after a bout of intense focus increases neuroplasticity by about 50%. And neuroplasticity is just a fancy word for how your brain restructures and reorganizes its function, which definitely would be great to do after studying or in a bout of intense focus. NSDR seems to provide the benefits of sleeping without actually sleeping. There is some good evidence for this and yogis have been using this one for centuries. For some studies, it is essentially just rebranded yoga nidra. I use this myself on occasion and it's definitely legit. And with that, meditation is definitely worthwhile as well. It is zero cost, will lead to improved sleep, improved cognition and mental health, and just overall well-being. So logically, this brings us to sleep, and his protocol for that's fantastic too. To summarize, he highlights the keys of viewing sunlight 30 to 60 minutes after waking to set your circadian rhythm, and optimize melatonin secretion at night. In addition, he says to avoid caffeine within eight to 10 hours of going to sleep, which is also legit. Wake up and go to sleep around the same times every single day, and avoid bright overhead lights in the nighttime hours, because it kind of simulates sunlight, which will confuse your body. I also enjoy a sleep cocktail of magnesium, apigenin, and L-theanine. Those are all rooted in quality signs. And don't forget to keep your room at a colder temperature and avoid alcohol before bed. Dr. Hubes definitely has you covered on sleep. As for the other fundamentals, his protocols on diet and exercise are pretty spot on too. Simply enough, exercise frequently, mostly at a low intensity, like zone two cardio that allows for nose breathing and trying to maintain a conversation. And definitely include some bouts of higher intensity throughout the week as well. And don't forget strength training three times a week. As for diet, eat varied, high quality, unprocessed foods. He highlights the importance of fiber for the gut microbiome and limiting refined sugar for reduced disease risk. Throw in some quality meat for protein sources, plenty of fruits and veggies for some antioxidants, and healthy fats and you're golden. That brings us to the gut microbiome. The medical community has honestly been in the dark about the gut microbiome for many, many years, so I'm happy to see a lot of research on that lately. The basics of Dr. Huberman's protocol, which are also spot on. Eat fermented foods for healthy gut bacteria. Eat fiber, sleep, avoid processed foods, don't over sanitize your environment. All evidence-based, Dr. Christian approved. So let's dive a little bit more into some of the niche techniques as well. So the ones I just discussed, they're the basics. We know these things. We need to evaluate some of the more niche techniques. And this first one is odd, but I do enjoy it. It's making lateral eye movements five to 10 times left and right in periods of high stress. Another way to simulate this is simply going on a walk where your just eyes are just scanning the environment, looking around, enjoying nature. This phenomenon is known as self-generated optical flow, which aids in reducing stress by inhibiting the amygdala, which is the center of your brain known for processing fear. This is actually a technique that's gaining a lot of traction in psychology as well. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR, utilizes rapid lateral eye movements to decrease the intensity of emotionally charged memories. It allows individuals to move forward from their past traumatic experiences. Personally, I make sure to engage in walking at least once a day where I'm doing some of these lateral eye movements, and I especially just do them randomly throughout the day if I notice myself becoming stressed or anxious. Nonetheless, whenever I do recognize that I'm stressed and I do these lateral eye movements, it does improve the situation. It's pretty weird. Next, let's transition into ultradian cycles, which is utilizing specific time intervals to maintain focus and productivity based on how our brains are wired. This is different than a circadian rhythm, which is your body's internal 24 hour clock. Ultradian cycles are repetitive body cycles that occur within that 24 hour period. So to begin with this ultradian rhythm, start with a five to 10 minute period where you ease into tasks, followed by a focused 60 to 90 minute period of study or work or whatever you need to do. Then deliberately shift your focus to something else for 10 to 30 minutes, a relaxation period. The objective is to complete one to three bouts of intense focus like this daily. This aims to synchronize your natural rhythms with your natural work rest cycles to boost productivity and focus. To leverage this, just divide your day into one to three periods of this intense focus. For me, it's essential to have at least one period of intense focus every single day, really no matter what I'm doing, but on a weekday, I probably aim for two, three, maybe even four. 
My process involves sitting down, switching my phone to do not disturb, getting it out of sight, and starting a 27 minute Pomodoro timer with three minute breaks, eventually leading to a whole 90 minute focus period. So let's move on to supplements. Now I did talk about some supplements earlier that didn't really have much evidence base behind them, but there are some that he highlights that are very quality. And unfortunately, there's really nothing groundbreaking here. The first one he emphasizes is creatine. Creatine is one of the most well-researched fitness supplements out there. Creatine offers many benefits, including enhanced muscle strength and power, increased muscle mass, increased exercise performance, and even some cognitive benefits as well, like improved focus, cognition, and resilience from sleep deprivation. In addition, it may also reduce fatigue from intense workouts as well. Next are omega-3 fatty acids, particularly EPA and DHA, which are found in omega-3 fish oil supplements. The goal is to target two grams of total EPA and DHA per day. The key here is to make sure that these supplements remain unoxidized by storing them away from light and refrigerating them. Omega-3 fatty acids are recognized for increasing focus, cognitive abilities, and potentially boosting mood. They also have some anti-inflammatory qualities that contribute to overall health and lower the risk of chronic diseases. Personally, some of the advantages I notice are a slight increase in perceived well-being and a reduction in delayed onset muscle soreness, which is just muscle soreness after your workouts. We also have magnesium, which I kind of touched on earlier with his sleep protocol. This is a great recommendation as honestly, half of Americans are deficient in magnesium to a certain extent. The last supplements I enjoy are the adaptogens, particularly ashwagandha and rhodiola rosea. There's quality evidence that ashwagandha provides a sense of calm by reducing cortisol, the main stress hormone, but these are not to be taken all the time, only in bouts of stress, so make sure you cycle those on and off. So now for the ugly. Should you listen to Dr. Andrew Huberman? I say yes. He explains the science of the body very well and does give good overall advice on becoming healthier, performing better, and having more quality in your life. When he dives into recommendations, defer and cross-reference with other experts in the industry. Dr. Huberman is very knowledgeable, but he isn't a guru as he's often just relaying scientific literature. Take everything with a grain of salt and mix and match things that you think might work for you. Science is constantly changing and evolving, which is definitely exciting to see. And if you're wondering where the ugly section actually is, there is none. Someone who doesn't put down others, often presents science objectively, and has benefited people's lives, doesn't need an ugly section. But no matter what his recommendations are, you have to stick to the basics. Lift weights, do cardio, eat healthy, go to sleep, maintain low levels of stress, simple as that. Thank you so much for watching my video on Dr. Andrew Huberman, the good, the bad, the ugly. If you like this video, make sure you drop a like. If there's any protocols you think are not legit, make sure to let me know in the comments. And if there are ones that have particularly changed your life, make sure to let me know of those too. Curious to try some new ones. Otherwise, make sure you subscribe for more videos on your best self. And if you wanna build muscle, lose fat, get in the best shape of your life, improve your health and confidence, make sure you hit the link in my bio to apply for one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. Thank you so much, and I will catch you in the next video.